In the previous video of lecture 30, uh, I had made an allegory that finite fields are to rings like finite cyclic groups are to group theory, okay? And I can actually solidify that analog in this theorem right here. Suppose we have a field, okay? And suppose, uh, since F is a field, that means the non-zero elements of that field form a group, okay? If G is a finite subgroup of the group of units of a field, then I claim that G is actually a cyclic group group, um, which necessarily is a finite cyclic group because we're assuming that G is a finite subgroup. Uh, this is an important example for finite fields because if F is a finite field, then F star is a finite is a finite group, and therefore every subgroup of F star, including F star itself, is a finite subgroup. So for finite fields, the group of units is in fact cyclic. So a when you look at a finite when you look at a finite uh, a finite field multiplicatively, it's basically just a cyclic group plus this zero element. All right. Um, of course, additively, um, it's an elementary abelian group. And so it's kind of interesting how you glue those things together. You take an elementary abelian group with respect to addition. You take a finite cyclic group uh, multiplicatively, multiplicatively plus a zero and you make a field. And that's every finite field. But we're going to prove a slightly general argument. So F could be an infinite field. Um, but if you take a finite subgroup of the, the group of units, that has to be a finite. Uh, that, that finite subgroup has to be cyclic. Okay, so since F is finite, it has some finite cardinality, call the order of that thing in. Um, now, if G were not cyclic, um, first of all, I should mention that uh, since F is a field, F star, uh, it's, it's going to be an abelian group because multiplication is commutative inside of a field. So G is a finite abelian group. So therefore, the fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups applies to uh, G here, and for which case we can factor G into a product of cyclic groups. Now, if G is itself not cyclic, that means it has a non-trivial exponent. Um, we know by Lagrange's theorem, if you take any element of your group, um, alpha, and you raise it to the order of the group, so alpha raised to n, you're going to get back 1. Um, that's, again, a consequence of Lagrange's theorem. Now, for a finite abelian group, we often care about this concept of an exponent. The exponent is the smallest number, uh, the smallest positive integer, m, such that if you raise any element in the finite abelian group to m, you get back 1. Now, if you take something like the Klein 4 group, z cross z2 cross z2, sure, the order of the group is equal to 4, but its exponent is equal to 2. If you square any element in the Klein 4 group, you're going to get back the identity. And so if you have a finite abelian group, which is not cyclic, then its exponent will be strictly smaller than the order. So if it's not cyclic, we're going to get that its exponent m is strictly less than its order n. Okay, so I want you to consider the polynomial x to the m minus 1, which then can be viewed as a polynomial over this field. Right? I mean, it only uses the coefficients 1 and negative 1. Uh, that really has nothing to do with any specific field, because every field has that. Okay. Now, if you take your element alpha and plug it into this polynomial, you're going to get alpha to the m minus 1. But by observation, since m is the exponent of this group, you're going to get alpha to the m is equal to 1. 1 minus 1 is equal to 0. So alpha, which belongs to g, is a root of this polynomial. But since, and this is true for every element of g, but since m is less than n, that means this polynomial has more roots than its degree, which is a contradiction. That then shows that the exponent um, and, the, and the order of the finite group must be equal, which then forces it to be cyclic. Uh, and therefore, that proves our theorem g is cyclic. And I just love this proof because it's, what, because it's like, wait, 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 wait. Because polynomials can't have more roots than their degrees, subgroups of a sub multiplicative subgroups of a field have to be cyclic. It's just so cool how those two seemingly unrelated elements come together for such an elegant, elegant proof right here. So yes, for a finite field, um, the unit group of that field is necessarily going to be cyclic. 
So for finite fields, we really are interested in this situation because since the whole set F star is cyclic as a multiplicative group, that means it has a generator. In fact, it has multiple generators. Um, that is, there exists some non-zero element of F such that every non-zero element of F can be expressed as an exponent, as a power of that element, call it alpha or something like that, right? Uh, such a thing is called a primitive root. And there's an analog for this, of course, in number theory, because in number theory, we're very much interested in the ring ZP, um, where P is, of course, a uh, prime in that situation, in which case number theory talks about the primitive root. There exists a non-zero element such that every other non-zero element is a power of that element. We call it a primitive root. Okay, um, number theory is really just a special case. Elementary number theory in that regard with primitive roots is just a special case of what we're talking about right now. ZP is a finite field. This is true for every finite field, um, and per including ZP as well. They have primitive roots. Now, of course, in number theory, we also talk about the ring ZP to the K. They also have primitive roots. Um, that goes askew to what we're talking about right now um, because this is not a field because uh, it does contain nil potent elements. Um, which in a field, the only no potent element is zero. But in particular, um, in, for a finite field, every finite field has a primitive root. Let's call that element alpha, okay? Um, if you take FP, a join alpha, this primitive root, that gives you F because every element of F other than zero um, is a power of alpha. So algebraically, we can produce every element just by taking powers of alpha right here. We really can. And so for finite fields, every finite field is a simple extension of the prime field FP. Remember, a simple extension is you would join one element to a field and you get a bigger field. Okay, so every finite field is a simple extension of the base field. We will see a similar result for fields of characteristic zero and such, uh, but that one's a lot more complicated. Uh, for finite fields, it's just so much simpler. Finite fields are just so well behaved. Let's do an example of this. Uh, consider the field Z2. So we're just going to work mod 2 here, binary coefficients 0 and 1. And take the degree 4 polynomial 1 plus x plus x to the fourth. I claim that this polynomial is irreducible. Now, if it has a root, then it has a linear factor. Let's show it has no roots. If you plug in zero, you end up with one. If you plug in one, you end up with one as well. So this polynomial has no linear factors because it has no roots. But it is a degree four polynomial. It could factor into quadratic uh, terms. Could that be possible? Well, over Z2, we proved this in a previous uh, video when we talked about the field of order four, uh, there's only one polynomial that's degree two that's irreducible over z2, and that's exactly x squared plus x plus one. So as there's no linear factors to f, if it factors at all, it has to factor into two quadratics, but there's only one irreducible quadratic, so it's got to be x squared plus x plus one quantity squared. But if you actually take x squared plus x plus one squared and, and you factor it uh, mod two, you're going to see the following. First of all, since you're squaring it, um, and we're working mod two, we can do freshman exponentiation. The exponent two distributes over rings of characteristic two. So x squared plus x plus one squared is the same thing as x squared squared plus x squared plus one, which that gives us x squared, excuse me, x to the fourth plus x squared plus one, which is not the same thing as one plus x plus x to the fourth. All right. Um, and therefore, this is not the same polynomial, and therefore that's exhausted every possibility. I mean, because we're over a finite field, um, we can. We, there's only a finite number of, of factorizations one can do for f. We've exhausted all of them, so f has to be irreducible in that situation. So since this is an, this, since this is an irreducible polynomial, we can take a root of this polynomial, call it alpha, and we can adjoin it to z2. That will then give us the field of order, uh, excuse me, two to the fourth, that is this would then give us the field of order 16. So F, uh, F2, oh, I'll, I'll put it as Z2 here. As Z2 adjoin this element alpha, this then gives us F16, okay? Now the important thing we should know about alpha here is it's the root of this polynomial. So we get that uh, alpha to the fourth plus alpha, excuse me, plus alpha plus one is equal to zero. Moving alpha and one to the other side, we get alpha to the fourth equals alpha plus one 
Um, although this is negative, but working mod two negative doesn't mean anything. So you get alpha to the fourth is equal to alpha plus one. This will help us with our reductions here. So be aware that F16 as a vector space is just the same thing as Z2 to the fourth. Uh, so we could think of everything as a just a binary uh, column vector with four entries. So we have two options. Uh, we have two options for the first one, two options for the second, two options for the third, two options for the fourth. We can make that identification in that situation. Although we're not going to think of it that way, we're going to think of it instead in, uh, not as a coordinate vector, but we think of it more um, as we have something here, some constant coefficient, then a1 alpha plus a2 alpha squared plus some a3 alpha cubed like so, because once you get up to alpha to the fourth, you can reduce it um, based upon this algebraic re relationship on alpha. So we never need a co linear combination with a higher power of alpha than alpha cubed, okay? But also by our previous result, I should mention that the group of units for F16 is in fact Z15. So this is a cyclic group of order 15. So that means every non-zero element inside of this ring should be written as a power of alpha. And so what we're gonna do is go through every single one of them. There are 15 of them, but it's really not that exhaustive. Uh, it's exhaustive, but it's not exhausting, okay? Clearly alpha to the first gives us alpha. Alpha squared gives us alpha squared. Alpha cubed gives us alpha cubed. Because remember, our goal is to write everything as a linear combination of one alpha, alpha squared, alpha cubed. That is, we want to write everything as a linear combination of the first four powers of alpha. So because of our relationship, alpha to the fourth is equal to one plus alpha, that gives us the first one. Now, alpha to the fifth is the same thing as alpha times alpha to the fourth. Alpha to the fourth is one plus alpha. So you distribute that and you're going to get alpha plus alpha squared. That gives us alpha to the fifth. And we work through this recursively, right? Um, alpha to the fifth, excuse me, alpha to the sixth is alpha times alpha to the fifth. So we times this by alpha. We're going to get alpha squared plus alpha cubed. Uh, then when we do alpha to the seventh, this is going to equal alpha times alpha squared plus alpha cubed. This is going to give you alpha cubed plus alpha to the fourth. We then reduce the alpha to the fourth as one plus alpha. So we get one plus alpha and alpha cubed. Uh, so we do that again, right? We're going to, for alpha to the eighth, we take the previous line, we times that by alpha. So that, if you times the previous line by alpha, you're going to get alpha plus alpha squared plus alpha to the fourth. Alpha to the fourth is the same thing as one plus alpha. The alpha is canceled because we're working mod two, and we're left with one plus alpha squared. Um, alpha to the ninth, we times the top by alpha. We get alpha plus alpha cubed, no reduction there. Um, if you times this one by alpha, you'll get alpha to the tenth. Um, your good alpha is then going to become alpha squared. Alpha cubed will become an alpha to the fourth, which gives us one plus alpha. Alpha to the 11th is formed by taking alpha to the 10th and times it by alpha. So you're going to get alpha, one becomes alpha, alpha becomes alpha squared, alpha squared becomes alpha cubed, no reduction necessary there. Alpha to the 12th times everything above by alpha, you're going to get alpha squared, alpha cubed, then you'll get an alpha to the fourth, which becomes one plus alpha. So now we got everything here represented, one plus alpha plus alpha squared plus alpha cubed. Uh, then if you take this times alpha to the 12th by alpha, that gives you alpha to the 13th. The above line, if we times it by alpha, we're going to end up with alpha plus alpha squared plus alpha cubed plus alpha to the fourth. Alpha to the fourth becomes one plus alpha. Um, so the alphas cancel. We're left with one plus alpha squared plus alpha cubed. We're almost there. Um, let's see, alpha to the 13th, if you times it by alpha, will give us alpha to the 14th. Take this, times it by alpha, you get alpha plus alpha cubed plus alpha to the fourth, which is one plus alpha. Uh, the alphas cancel, you get one plus alpha cubed. Um, and then if we do this one more time, because we claim we're at the end, alpha to the 14th times alpha, you get alpha to the 15th, and we claim that alpha was a primitive root here, it should be one here. If we do that, you're going to get one plus alpha to the cube times that by alpha. You're going to get alpha plus alpha to the fourth. Alpha to the fourth is one plus alpha. The alphas cancel. We get back one. Um, and so when you look at this list, we get 15 different elements. The only thing who's missing, of course, is zero. But we throw that into the field there. Um, we get 15 different elements. There was no repetition. And exactly at the 15th moment, this thing repeats itself. And so we do see that alpha, in fact, is this primitive root um, for the field F16 that we observed right here. And this can be done for essentially every finite field. Clearly the exact calculations will differ, but this is one of the cool things about finite fields. Multiplicatively, they are cyclic. They always have these primitive roots. One element will rule them all and in the darkness bind them.